So we're going to begin reading in Jude chapter 1 and verse 1. Is everybody there? Shout amen. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who were called, he's speaking to the church, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Jude opens his letter with the notation that he is a servant of Jesus Christ, but he's also the brother of James, and he is addressing his letter to the beloved in God the Father, specifically the church. He then decrees that mercy and peace and love of God be multiplied to those who read that letter. It's very reminiscent of the instructions of Jesus. I talked about this on Sunday, that whenever he tells his disciples, he says, whenever you enter a house and they receive you, speak your peace over the house. But if they're unwilling to receive you, call your peace back to yourself, knock the dust from your clothes and move on, right? So Jude is speaking mercy and peace and love over the church. And as I made note in the opening uh, remarks regarding the history of this letter, James is the half-brother of Christ who was the head of the Jerusalem council, which is discussed and outlined in the book of Acts chapter 12 and verse 17. And it is specifically noted as James, the brother of Jesus. So again, Mary did not remain a virgin. And furthermore, Mary is not the co-redemptress and co-mediatrix for the church. The Bible is abundantly clear that there is but one mediator. Shout one. There is but one mediator between God and man, and that is the God-man, Jesus Christ. There is but one way to get there, and that is through the Lord Jesus. Thus, Jude refers to James as his own brother. And then Jude is in, the, is in this direct correlation of relationship to Christ as well. Jesus had siblings. The book of St. John specifically in chapter 7 notates the brothers going to the Feast of Booths and Jesus tarrying for a while but then going up himself. Verse 3, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed. Isn't this very reminiscent of, of Philippians and, and Colossians? You know, they have crept in unaware. As it were, y'all have not been paying attention. And you've let people creep in and start to teach things and, 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 and drive things and agendas that are not right. He says, he says, I'm writing to you, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. They're ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. I want you to note in verse 3 <clears throat> that Jude makes reference to his desire to write about something else but he finds it necessary to write an appeal to the church to contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And I will tell you this, that I feel very confident to make the following statement, that if the Apostle Paul was still alive, the American church would have already got some letters. As I've told you once before, I tell you again through weeping that if you're not careful, you'll become an enemy of the cross. This verse suggests that the church apparently somehow has gotten off course by not adhering to what was first given to them, and they have drifted from where they first began. This is the reason why Jude is calling them back to the beginning to get back on track. Friends, just as in our nation, the moment we walked away from what allowed us to become what we are, we have become off base. And whenever the church of the Lord Jesus Christ begins to walk away from solid doctrine and biblical teachings and what was accepted by the apostolic leaders of the early church, we are destined to wind up in error. Because, friends, there are no new revelations. There's only old heresies or old truths that are revisited. This is why we've got to know what we believe and why we believe the way that we believe. The greatest forms of deception have enough truth to make it palatable, but not enough truth to make it real. This is what challenged me in that video of this argument over Jesus never said he was God. It's easy to say that whenever you don't understand the principle of culture that words mean a lot to the Hebrew people, especially specific phrases, which is what we're going to be dealing with in just a few minutes.
In verse 4, just as Paul is contending for the churches at Colossae and Philippi as well in his letters to Titus and to Philemon, here we see the very same thing that Jude is speaking to in verse 4. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. They are ungodly people. They have perverted the grace of God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. I want to make a statement, and I'm, and I'm not here to argue with anybody. I just want to present a, a, a statement here. The Bible says that all other sins except that of sexual immorality is a sin outside of the body. Sexual immorality and sexual impurity is a sin against your body. All sin is not the same. Well, sin is sin, pastor. No, it's not. On two points. Sexual sin is a sin against your own body. First point. The, the second point is this, if all sin was the same, then why did the law of Moses require certain sacrifices for certain sins? I'm not trying to contend, I'm just offering some insight because we have to let the Bible interpret what, what we believe and not our opinions or feelings on the matter. Our culture has become so sensual now, right? So we have to understand that sin is not just sin. That whenever we commit sexual sin, the Bible instructs us it is a sin against our own body. Every other sin, the Bible says it this way, every other sin is done without the body. But sexual immorality is a sin against the body. Why is that such a big deal? Because your body is the what? It is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Why do you think Paul said this? He said, what dealings does the temple of God have with the temples of Belial? The principle is, is what does kingdom people who were born again have to do with prostitutes and pagan cultures? Why are you embracing perversion that is destructive in nature? I know that's challenging, but it's Bible. This is why you need to keep your britches on. Right? This is why you need to put a ring on it before y'all get in between the sheets. Right? Because the byproduct of intimacy, the byproduct of intimacy is procreation. But the genesis of intimacy is covenant. See, but we don't want covenant because we don't want, we don't want responsibility for what we're doing or more so specifically who we're doing it with, which is now why abortion is an option. Because we want love without responsibility. We want, we, we want relationship without the burden. We want sex without the, come on. I, I, know, I know I'm plowing the road, but I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to something because we live in a culture now that is so embracing of these things around us. And what are we going to do? How can we correct something and protect our children if we ourselves are embracing it and letting it in our homes? Friends, that doesn't make you legalistic. That makes you intelligent. Right? And so anyways, moving forward. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved the people out of the land of Egypt. Now I'm going to take my time here because this is the launch pad for my second and third sermon before I get back to my first sermon. Now I want to remind you that although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, shout Jesus, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt. Now, wait a minute. Save people out of the land of Egypt? Jesus wasn't born yet. That was Moses. No, keep, keep reading. This is, this is Bible. Jesus, who saved people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay in their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he is kept in eternal chains under, under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, I could really deep teach on that. The unnatural desire is not what you think it is. But I'm, I, don't have, I don't have the time to get there and y'all ain't got a bucket of chicken. <clears throat> they indulge into sexual immorality and they pursued unnatural desire and serves as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Notice all of these ended in judgment. 
He saved the people out of Egypt, but then he destroyed those who didn't believe. The angels rebelled, and then he binds them in everlasting darkness until the great and terrible day of the Lord. Sodom and Gomorrah winds up into sin, and he not just destroys them, he just destroys everything that is around them. Now, there's a tremendous amount of insight that we need to unpack just in these three verses. I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes on three verses. Is that all right? I hope it is, because I'm, 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 I'm going to do it anyway. Some of y'all smile. You're like, I don't know what to do. It's all right. We're going to get into some deep things. Verse 5 addresses those being delivered out of Egypt and Jesus' involvement in their deliverance. Verse 6 speaks to Christ's authority over not just the unnatural, or excuse me, not, not just the natural and the power to have the authority in our realm of existence, but also in other realms of existence, namely the spirit realm. And Jude refers to it. So that, he is to, so that they are kept in everlasting chains of darkness and judgment until the day of the Lord. Verse 7 addresses the fact that the judge of all the earth who has exited, excuse me, who has executed his authority from, from the beginning was also the authority by which Sodom and Gomorrah were, were destroyed. Now, why are these three verses so important? Because these verses lend to us insight and view of the apostles' view in regards to their view of Christ regarding his divine nature, which was active in the world from the very beginning of creation, long before his incarnation. Far too many of us only look at Christ through his authority of incarnation, of being born in the flesh through Mary in Bethlehem. The, the authority of Christ spans all the way back to Genesis. Is everybody ready to go deep? Now, I want to talk about something before we talk about the incarnation and the authority of Christ. This is what the Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 6. When man began to multiply upon the face of the land, daughters were born to them, and the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any that they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh, his days shall be 120 years. Verse 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children unto them. These were the mighty men who were, who were, from old, who were of old, rather, the men of renown. Now, what does that have to do with anything? In Genesis chapter 6, we are introduced to a concept of the sons of God coming into the earth and procreating with the daughters of men. Listen to me as your pastor. The following thing that I am hearing perpetuated theologically is heretical in nature because it cannot be biblically proven. There is a teaching that is coming out now that the sons of God noted in Genesis chapter 6 are actually the sons of Seth. There is no way that you can prove that biblically. Here's why. Because the law of first mention in regards to the Hebrew language dealing with the sons of God in Hebrew, this is what it says, Bechanet Elohim. Every time that phrase is used, it is always, 110% of the time in your Bible, it is in reference to the angels of God. Every time. So we cannot, and I shared this with, with a brother earlier, it is very frustrating for me that we're living in a day now to where theologians are trying to remove the supernatural from the Scripture. Why are we trying to remove the supernatural from the Scripture? Everything about our faith is supernatural. The fact that you're born again is supernatural. The fact that the Holy Ghost is on the inside of you is supernatural. The fact that God cared enough to save you is supernatural. The fact that the Son of God died on a tree and then three days later got up is supernatural. Everything about our faith is supernatural. Why are we trying to separate the supernatural from the Scripture? We can't. Now, there are those who contend against that. We can contend against it all day long, but here's the deal. If it's in the Bible, I'm right. That's not a statement of arrogance. That's a statement of assurance. That, I just read to you what, what the Scripture says. Genesis chapter 6 is record regarding the sons of God coming in laying with the daughters of men, and from them came the Nephilim, the giants. We know giants existed. Goliath existed. He had four brothers. That's the reason why David got five stones out of the creek, because he knew if he killed his, he, he knew that if he killed Goliath, he was going to start a blood feud. And all four of those additional giants were killed during David's rise to kingship. The last one almost killed him, which was an unnamed giant who had six fingers and six toes that lived on top of the mountain. Now, why do I bring any of that up? Because apparently Jude felt it important enough to bring it up in one verse. 
But there's some insight that Jude lends to us in the words that he uses in the Greek regarding these angels. Because one of the arguments has been, well, Jesus said that whenever we get to heaven, that we will be as the angels and we, and we will not be married or given in marriage. And the view of that has been is that we will not be given or, or taken in marriage because there'll be no means of physical consummation or intimacy. Therefore, angels can't have babies and we won't be able to have babies because angels can't procreate. Pause. Pause. I want you to get out your notes if you have them. And I want to walk us through something here. <clears throat> is everybody tracking with me? I'm trying to talk as fast as I can because I, I feel like the Smokey and the Bandit movie. Got a long way to go and a short time to get there. Come on. <laughs> Please don't send me no hate. You watching them heathen movies. I ain't watched that movie in years. Some of y'all heathen because you know what song I was singing. Anyways. So this is what Jude says in Jude chapter 1 and verse 6. This is in the Greek that is in, that, that is in the packet. If you don't have that, please look on with a neighbor or, or otherwise. And the angels who did not stay within their own domain, their own domain, but abandoned their, notice plural, their dwelling, he keeps, he being Jesus, keeps under darkness in eternal chains for the day of the Lord. I want you to back up to, to page number two. The word used here for domain is archon. Archon interprets to mean commencement or chief beginning. So whenever Jude makes the statement that they did not stay within their own domain, the, the context of domain is not a domicile or a place of existence. It was a state of being. The reference here was to what they were originally created as. And they changed their original state of being. Now some will say, well, how did that happen? I don't know. But I know it's in the Bible because it says that they did not stay within their own domain. They did not remain in their original state of creation. It goes on to move forward, it says, but not only did, did they not stay within their original state of creation or the place of which that they started or their original state of being, it says, but they also abandoned their plural dwelling, akaterion. Behold, I will go in and prepare a place for you, for in my Father's house are many Akaterions, rooms, places of dwelling. So these angels were originally created in one form or fashion. And somehow, according to your Bible, they transitioned from one state of being into another state of being. And then they left their original place of dwelling and they came into the earth and they started procreating with the daughters of men. They left their dwelling because they changed their being. Now it's very interesting that we're in a day now to where everybody is consumed with identity. If you look at the scripture, the, the demoniac that Jesus dealt with, what did he say? He asked him what his name, he said, we are a legion for we are many. There's nothing new under the sun. So now you've got people identifying as things that they're not because what are they trying to do? They're trying to change their commencement or chief beginning and change their place of being. They're trying to change their identity and their dwelling. And these beings came into the earth. 
And according to your Bible, Genesis chapter 6, it happened. And according to the book of Jude in verse one, in chapter 1 and verse 6, it literally says that they not just abandoned their original state of being, they fled their, their original place of occupancy and came into the earth. And that's why Jesus has now bound them in darkness until the great and terrible day of judgment of the Lord. It's interesting, this word is used somewhere else that we're going to talk about in just a second. Now, why do I bring all of that up? Because in Genesis chapter 6, whenever the giants were created, there's a very specific verse I want to draw your attention to. The Bible says in regards to Noah, it says that Noah was perfect in all of his generations. That has nothing to do with the sinless nature of Noah. What that deals with is the genetic pool that Noah came from. Noah was not, he was not a Nephilim. There's this thing come out now where, well, Noah was a giant because he would have had to have been to build the ark. The whole point of him being chosen to build the ark was that his bloodline was pure. And what's interesting now is in our society, there's this infatuation with genetic and DNA modification. It's in your Bible. Amen. Noah was not a Nephilim. Noah was perfect in all of his generations tracing back to Adam because he had not had any infiltration from this. Some of y'all are like, I ain't never heard that before, and I don't even know if I believe that. You believe in the supernatural for salvation, but apparently this was so assured and understood that the early church fathers had no problem talking about it. But now you talk about giants in this day and age, and like, oh, that's just Bible stories. You understand that was the byproduct of genetic hybridization of man and non-humanoid beings procreating and creating superhumans. All I just said was what the modern vernacular is for what was taking place in Genesis chapter 6. That's the reason, whew, I'm about to go deeper here, and I, even had no, I, had no re, I had no intents to go here. In Genesis chapter 3, whenever God judges what? He judges the man, the woman, and the serpent. He judges the serpent last. He, in the judgment to the serpent, what does he say? He said, soon shall come a man from a woman's seed, a woman's seed. You shall strike at his heel, but he shall bust your head. I'm going somewhere. A man shall come from a woman's seed. A woman doesn't have a seed. A woman has a womb. The man has the seed. Soon shall come a man from a woman's seed, virgin birth. You shall strike at his heel. He shall bust your head. Bust your head. Now, where was Jesus crucified at? The place of the skull called? <clears throat> the place of what? Place of skull. Goal. Gath, uh, Goliath of Gath. I can prove that biblically because the time that David cut uh, his head off, it says that he carried it to Jerusalem, went on a mountain overlooking the city and buried it there. That place was a place of memorial of a prophetic word against the city that David would one day conquer it. Hence the reason why he conquered Salem and renamed it Yerushalayim or city of peace where David shall rule from his kingdom. And Jesus was crucified at the place of the skull overlooking the city. Hence the reasons why the soldiers could look across the king's valley into the temple and see the veil torn in two and feel the earthquake. Because the place that the skull of Goliath was the place that they will strike your heels, but you shall bust his 
head. That's good. That's good preaching. I could close right there and give an altar call and we could shout hallelujah. <clears throat> if the Genesis 6 issue and Jude chapter 1 and verse 6 were, were not a big deal, then why was it strategically ordained by God in Genesis chapter 3 for the Messiah to be crucified in the place of the skull that the giant was buried overlooking the city? The prophecy was tied to destroying the works of the devil. I will put enmity between thy seed and her seed. Seed, seed, procreation. They're going to be different. And the giants were different. And it's interesting if you, you do a word of word study of Goliath's name, it actually means soothsayer. His name literally means soothsayer. Goliath was not just a man of war, he was a warlock. That's the reason why David, when he comes, he asks the question. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that's cursing the armies of God? It wasn't him going, just send me your champion and we will fight. And if I win, y'all become our slaves. And if I lose, and you know, then, then we'll become yours. No, he was literally cursing, word cursing, soothsaying against the nation. That's the reason why they were scared to death. It wasn't just a physical battle. It was a supernatural one. I had no intention to even teach on any of that. But if, the, but if all of that was not important, then why was Jesus crucified at the place of the skull? Why does Jude bring up in, in verse 6 regarding the angels who abandoned their first estate and left their domain? And because of what they did, they have now been bound in darkness until the great and terrible day of the Lord. Why is all of that important? Because the authority of Jesus did not begin at his incarnation. The authority of Jesus began at the creation of existence. I want you to look with me. <clears throat> They're going to put up uh, John chapter 1 and verse 1. Will you all put that up for me, media team, please? Everybody doing good? Anybody learn at least one thing that you've never heard before tonight? Okay. <clears throat> Say it with me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. Who is He? Jesus. Verse 3. All things were made through Him. Who is Him? Jesus. And without Him, who is Him? was not anything made that was made. Back up to John 1. <clears throat> I'm going to show you something that's going to give you whew. I told Mike before service, I said my brains are about ready to run out of my ears because I'm so excited about what I'm about to show to you. You remember what I, remember the word I used a few minutes ago? Where's my doodler? There we are. Remember that word archon? Remember, they abandoned their domain, Archon. In the beginning was the word. That word beginning there, if you've got those notes, and I, if you don't, I'll email them to you. The word beginning there is the word Arche. Arche, it is the exact same word used for domain, archon, it means the exact same thing. It is a commencement or a chief beginning or a start. Now, this is very interesting. Any of you ever heard of the word chronos? Chronos, the word, the word if you've heard, if you, have you heard the word chronos? Have you heard of the word kairos? Okay, chronos is where we get time. Watch, chronological time. 
chronos and kairos is a moment or season. Now it's interesting that in John in verse 1, chapter 1 in verse 1, that John doesn't use the term in the beginning of chronos or in the beginning of times or seasons. He does not use chronos and he doesn't use kairos. He uses this term arche. Arche literally means before anything else existed, he existed. Before, uh, excuse me, before time, creation, kairos, moments, seasons, before anything existed that could exist in existence, to exist by any form of existence, he existed before any of that. Is everybody with me? Have, have I made that clear as mud? In the beginning, archon. But this is what is very unique. In the Greek, the word for was is this word. Say it with me, in, in, E-N with a hyphen above the E. Now, what does that say in Greek? I am, I exist. In the beginning, before time, space, anything existed, I am, I exist. In the beginning, I exist. The word was, the word I am, I exist, was with God, Theon. Theon. And was God, Theos. Who, Holy Ghost and fire, help me. Let me show you something really unique. Please forgive my handwriting. In the beginning, I am and I existed as the Word, and the Word existed with God, and the Word, I am, I exist as God. Everywhere you see am, it literally means I. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was I am, I exist, and the word was, I am, I exist. Now, what's interesting to this is the in in Greek is third person. Some of you are like, Pastor, where is any of this going and why is this important? I promise you, once I get to my point, you're going to understand why I'm talking through all of this. For some, biblical languages is about as boring as watching paint dry but it's important to understand where I'm going. In is was, I am, I exist. In the Gospel of St. John in chapter 8 and verse 58, Jesus is challenged by the crowd. And he says, Abraham rejoiced at the day in which that you're seeing. And yet, there's this issue. And, and then they said, you're not even 50 years old yet, but yet you say that you know Abraham. And Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Remember the in. Jesus makes the statement... In is third person. Whenever Jesus said, I am, this is actually what he said in Greek. Ego imai. Ego imai. Ego imai. Ego 
is first person. He technically said, I am the I am. And that's why the Bible says in, in verse 59 that they picked up stones and sought to kill him. But he hid himself and slipped out of the temple. Now, why is all of that important? Because in the book of Genesis, excuse me, in the book of Exodus chapter 3, when Moses is having a conversation with God, Moses asked the question, who shall I say sent me? And what did the Lord tell him? What? I am who I am. Iya Asur Iya. What does Iya mean? Iya means I am. I exist. Two different languages with the same defining word that God used to, de to define himself for Moses when he went into the nation to deliver the nation of, of Israel out of Egypt. Moses asked God, who shall I say sent me? And the Lord said, I am who I am. You tell them that the I am has sent you. The Iya. You tell them that I am and I exist who I am and I exist. We've worked it in reverse. Now let's work it back forward. You've got God identifying himself by a reference and not by his name. Iya asur iya. I am who I am. You've got John in John's gospel in chapter 1 and verse 1 saying in the beginning was I am. In the beginning was the I am and I exist. In the beginning was the was I am and I exist. The word and the word was I am I exist with God. And the word was, I am and I exist as God. He says, Lord Jesus. He says, I'm with God. But I am God. He uses two different words. The word was with Theon. The word with there means companionship or to be facing towards. This is all in your notes. I'm just trying to keep from belaboring the point and boring some of y'all to tears. He says, with God, Theon was Theos. So whenever people try to say that Jesus never said that he was God, all you got to do is look at Exodus chapter 3, John chapter 1, and John chapter 8. Because Jesus said, ego, am I, I, I am. I, ego, individual, singular, personal, ego, I I am. And the moment he used the term I am, he identified as God and the people lost their mind. So whenever he says, I am the bread of life, I am, I exist as, I am the way, truth, life. I am salvation. I am the light of men. I am because I exist as everything you will ever need 
for me to be. Because Jesus is God. He did not become God. He was not born as God. He always existed as God. I shared all of that to provide context to three verses. It's the fact that Jesus always existed as God. Why Jude made the statement that it was Jesus who delivered them out of Egypt, but yet destroyed those who didn't believe. It was Jesus who dealt with the angels who rebelled and bound them in everlasting darkness until the day of judgment. It was Jesus who dealt with Sodom and Gomorrah and destroyed the cities around it. Any of you ever heard of the term theophany? A theophany or the term theophany is a big theological word that just simply means this. An Old Testament manifestation of Christ. Give you some examples of theophanies. The three angels or the three men come to Abraham's tent. Only two of them made it to Lot's house. The third one remained in what Abraham con- c- argued with. If there be but 50, would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? This is what's very important for you to understand. Whenever Abraham made this statement, he gave us a key. He made this statement to the Lord. He said, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Shall you suffer the righteous to perish with the wicked? Box that up. Jump all the way into the book of the Revelation. You remember John gets to heaven? Nobody's worthy to open the scroll. John begins to weep. He's broken. He's panicking. There's nobody who's worthy to open the scroll. The angel turns to him and says, Behold, there is a lamb who has the right, who is worthy to take the scroll. And he takes the scroll and he starts breaching the seals and judgment starts pouring out on the earth. The reason why Jesus had the authority to do that is because he is the judge of all the earth. That did not happen because of Calvary. That happened because of Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, the I am existed. And God used the word and spoke. And what's really cool is when you look at John chapter 1 and verse 2. If you read verse 2 in reverse, it is chapter 1. Or verse 1, right side up. You take the verses and invert them. They say the same thing backwards. Anytime God starts repeating himself, you better pay attention to what he's saying. Oh, that's good. And I look at that. I got three minutes. Is everybody good? I just, all these notes, and y'all got all that. It took me six hours to do all of this, and y'all got it in 15 minutes. But friends, Jesus is God. The, The disciples asked Jesus, they said, when will we be allowed to see the Father? And Jesus made the statement, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus made statements like this. The Father and I are one. Right? Jesus is God. That's the reason why Jude was so affirmed in making the statement that the judgments of Sodom and Gomorrah, the judgments of the fallen angels of Genesis 6, and the judgment on the nation of Egypt, and even judging those who didn't believe, it all came back to Christ. Because shall not the judge of all the earth do right? He's the I am for a reason. Now, people say, well, if he's God, then what about God the Father? What about God the Son? What about the Holy Spirit? What about Trinity versus Unitarianism? What about all? Okay, I'm going to help all of you. In the book of Acts, Stephen's being stoned to death, right? If you back up a couple of verses, it says, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, stood up and began to preach to them. Holy Spirit. 
While he's dying, what does he see? The Father sitting on the throne and Jesus standing at his right hand. You've got a man full of the Holy Spirit, born again and on his way to heaven, being martyred for the faith. And his last experience on this side of eternity is seeing the Messiah standing up for his sacrifice. First martyr. So you've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all in one story. And if you look at the Greek in John 1, he was with companion, but he was what? He was one. How can you be with, but yet separate, but yet one? If you figure any of that out, please help me. Because people argue and contend over that. And you understand, that's an argument that spans the eons of millennia back to the first century church to where the church was trying to figure out how do they even define what they experienced. Because he, he was indescribable. He was indefinable. He was, they, they, they couldn't put into words. That's the reason why you got four different gospels because everybody had different experiences and different views. That doesn't dis discount one and accredit the other. They all fall in line. Why? Because they're all talking about the same great I am. I feel like preaching now and I got to hurry up and land the plane. Can I have five minutes? It's 740. It's 745. We're going to land the plane. Everybody turn with me, look with me to verse 8. <clears throat> Yet in like manner, these, these people also, relying on their dreams, they defile the flesh and reject authority. They blaspheme the glorious ones. I ain't going to close in five minutes. Sorry. <laughs> verse 9. I'm, 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 Y'all just need to go look at my notes for, for that are on the, on the app. I'm not even going to get past verse 9. I'm, I'm going to close with this thought. I'm going I'm to learn how to land the plane a little better. Verse 9, but when Michael the archangel contending with the devil was disputing over the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebukes you. Verse 8 and verse 9 deal with those who dishonor and disregard authority at any and all levels. And at this point of Jude, he references to Michael the archangel not bringing a blasphemous judgment against Satan, but rather stood on the judgment of the Lord. If Michael the archangel, you listen to me and, and you hear what I'm about to tell you. If Michael the archangel did not manifest dishonor to a fallen angel. I'm going to start over. If Michael the archangel did not manifest dishonor even to a fallen angel, then we must all be more aware that we must not dishonor the glorious one that we serve. We live in this day now to where we're going we're gonna to take authority over the principality of this city and we're going to cast him down and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. You understand the Bible says that every power and principality, throne, dominion, and authority in heaven and earth and below the earth have been established and are judged by him. None of us are the final authority. So if we're going to pray, we have to pray biblically and be spiritually led, not spiritually cuckoo and biblically ignorant. Because there's a lot of things that are called to be spiritual now that you can't find anywhere in the Bible and the teachings of the first and second and third century church do not support it. If the prince of Persia in the book of Daniel, thank you, I almost said Isaiah and I knew that was wrong. If the prince of Persia in the book of Daniel had the authority to stop Gabriel, the archangel, the messenger from God, from God himself to Daniel, and to withhold him for weeks before he could finally show up and give the word, and Michael the archangel had to come and wage war with this principality to get that angel released to bring the word to Daniel, the only authority that you have is when you pray and God himself makes the edict. That's the reason why the Bible says... That Michael the archangel brought not a railing accusations against the devil whenever they contended over the body of Moses. But he simply said, the Lord rebukes you. We have no authority outside of Christ. That authority was so poignant 
that Jude gave three different examples just in the Old Testament themselves that it took Christ's authority to deal with, not you and not me. And my question for all of us is, shall not, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? You hear me as your pastor. Things may be evil. Things may be dark. People may be doing terrible things. But the truth will always come out. And Jesus will deal with those things. Whether it be in this life or the next, nobody gets out of this life alive And nobody gets out of this life without consequence for the way that they lived. So we have to bear that in mind. I close with with verse 10. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand. And they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them. For they walked in the way of Cain... They abandoned themselves to the sake of gain to Balaam's error, and they perished in Korah's rebellion. I close with this. What was Jude referencing to? The murderous spirit of Cain, the greed of Balaam, and the rebellion of Korah. He's dealing with the spirit of the church. That when we become murderous, whenever we become greedy, And whenever we become rebellious and destructive, God will deal with us. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? He will. He will. And if he didn't let those in Egypt slide by, if he didn't let the angels that led rebellion slide by, and if he didn't let Sodom and Gomorrah slide by, Become not weary at the chastisement of the Lord. For just as a good father corrects the the child in which he loves, so does the Lord correct the child in whom he delights. Let's guard our lives. And let's all be aware and sobered to the fact that one day all of us are going to have to answer to the I am And my prayer is that all of us will have the answer. And his name is Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Again, thank you for indulging me with some of these teachings, with allowing to get into some of the biblical languages. Guys, I love being able to do that. It lends, again, how much of that lent in insight to your faith on things, right? So now whenever you see these stupid videos, well, Jesus never said himself to be God. Yes, he did. <laughs>